Childhood cancer is the leading cause of disease-related death among children and adolescents in the United States. While the causes of pediatric cancer are not well understood, survival rates for many cancer types have improved in recent years. Tonight, our experts will take your questions about detecting and treating the most common types of childhood cancer. We'll also talk about preventing secondary cancers later in life and the need for new, more effective treatments for cancer's youngest warriors. Our toll-free number is 1- 1-800-543-8242 and our email address is connect at wpsu.org. You can also join us on Twitter. Find us under the address at WPSU and use the hashtag WPSU Conversations. Tonight we're initiating a discussion about childhood cancer which we hope you'll continue after watching the PBS documentary Cancer, the Emperor of All Maladies, presented by Ken Burns. It airs next Monday evening, March 30th through April 1st at 9 on WPSU. And now let's meet our guest. Dr. Ray Hall is director of the Penn State Hershey Cancer Institute. He's also a professor of medicine and pharmacology. Jan Ulmer is the senior manager of the American Cancer Society's mission delivery for Pennsylvania. Her responsibilities include the implementation and growth of several programs, including Road to Recovery, Reach to Recovery, Look Good, Feel Better, and a free wig program. And joining us on Skype is Dr. John Neely, a pediatric oncologist at Penn State Hershey Children's Hospital. Dr. Neely specializes in integrative holistic medicine and pediatric hematology oncology. Thank you all so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. I'll begin with you, uh, Dr. Healy. Uh, you know, when we, uh, when we think about the death of a child from disease, that's a, uh, very rare in the United States, except from cancer. And so I, I would like you to begin by telling us just how common childhood cancers are. Well, yeah, that's a very good question. You know, it is amazing because when I teach medical students about medicine in the turn of the last century, the number one killer was infectious disease. And children the age of two and three quite commonly died of infection. And now it is not even on the top ten list of the reasons for deaths. The number one cause uh, is cancer which is really unusual in a way because uh, cancer is quite rare in children. Uh, for example, if uh, we tend to look at data in uh, terms of uh, per 100,000 children, so you can imagine how many you know pediatric practices you have to have for 100,000 children, and the incidence of leukemia, which is the, the most common type of cancer in children, is seven in 100,000 children. So, and when you combine them all together, it's about 35 per 100,000 of all kinds of cancer. So it is, in any given year, it's not that much. But when you add it up over the course of 18 years, it's about one in 350 children to young adults end up getting cancer. And I'm reading, I'm reading that some, somewhere in the neighborhood of 40,000 uh, 40, uh, children from zero to age 19 are undergoing cancer treatment right now. Um, you know, when we think about cancer among adults, we think lung cancer, breast cancer, a colon cancer, which are, are rarely occur in children. What, what are the most prevalent cancers uh, among children? Well, the typical ones are from the, uh, the lymphoid system, so it's either the immune system. So it's either leukemia, uh, which typically is from lymph cells, although it can be from other white cells, and then lymphomas, which are closely related but more lumpy in disease, and then brain tumors. Those are the three most common. Then there are a whole series of other tumors that come from other smaller organs in the body, like kidney, uh, Wilms tumor is, is relatively common. There's a very difficult tumor called neuroblastoma that comes from the adrenal glands, and then a smattering of other tumors from muscle and bone and things like that. But leukemia and lymphoma and brain tumors are the, really the top three. 50, 50 years ago, something like acute lymphoblastic leukemia, ALL, would have killed uh, mo most children would have d died from that. Today, 90% survive. So it sounds like there is some good news when we talk about pediatric cancers. Well, that's correct. Um, and you're absolutely right. I, when I think back, when I was a child, um, if you had leukemia, it was a death sentence. Uh, children rarely live beyond six months after the diagnosis. And over the course of time, mostly through research 
uh, with what are called cooperative groups, where all of the children's hospitals in the nation and now internationally band together and learn how to treat children with cancer, various cancers the same way across the country, across the world, and then we learn so much faster. It's interesting, Dr. Hull, he, he mentioned this, uh, not only this inter, interdisciplinary approach, but also this uh, multiple institutions working on children's cancer. Is that the case with adult cancer, that institutions work together? Sure. It, it most certainly is. So we have a number of, of what we refer to as cooperative groups that are really sponsored by the National Cancer Institute, and they allow many institutions to come together uh, to have the same experimental treatment protocol available to their patients. So it's in many regards just like it is in pediatrics uh, where, uh, but the difference is is that f adult cancers are obviously much, much more common. Uh, they're different cancers uh, and as a result, whereas for children, one can have a fewer numbers of cooperative groups uh, and there's a tendency for many investigators and physicians and pediatric oncologists to come together and treat uh, those, those children according to a protocol. Uh, in For adult oncology, uh, there are many hundreds of protocols that are available through these various cooperative group systems uh, and then through individual institutions. Uh, and so the buffet of options, if you will, uh, is substantially larger. How much do we know about, and I'll, I'll ask this of you, Dr. Neely, how much do we know about what causes pediatric cancer? And I ask that because when we talk about uh, cancer among adults, we talk about uh, viruses and environment chemicals and uh, uh, heredity, genes. How much do we know about what causes cancer in children? Yeah, I used and, to and is it probably a, a different mechanism at work? Uh, I suspect it is in part. I used to think I had a better handle on this, but I think as we have understood genetics and environmental influences on genes, I'm uh, less sure about this. But I would say one thing that seems to be true about children in general is they get cancers at a young age, so it's it's hard to say that they've had 20 years or 30 years of smoking as an you know as a cause. And many times under the microscope, the tumors in children look suspiciously like the developing uh, cells of an embryo. So we've often thought that cancer in children seems to be a mistake in the switching of these, these tissues that are meant to grow pretty rapidly in the embryo and the developing baby and never get shut off. So uh, for instance, Wilms tumor, which is this kidney tumor, has cells in it that look just suspiciously like uh, the the kind of kidney cells that are in a in a fetus and and so I think it's it's that kind of signaling that's somewhat different than in adults but there are other cancers in children that um, that I think have some other causative agent that we're not sure of yet the, the same cells then that are responsible for our growth uh, can turn on us and and create cancer is basically what you're saying Dr. Neely Right, and uh, I mean, a good example is um, this tumor called neuroblastoma, which is in the adrenal gland, which sits just above the kidneys, and it can be in a couple of other places in the body. But we know from um, when we've looked at babies like that have been born prematurely and, and die for other reasons, like infections or in, immature lungs or something like that, when they're examined, we have found that there are unusually large numbers of neuroblastoma-like cells in this very young pre preterm baby, and they go away. And so we think that these in the, in the embryo, these things come and go and develop and then go away, and in some of these pediatric tumors, they come and they don't go. I'd like to turn to you, Jan Ulmer. The National Cancer Institute, which is the organization uh, that uh, works on, on cancer in the United States and is in the world, really, uh, receives $5 billion a year for cancer research. Only about 4% uh, of that goes to fund research for pediatric cancers. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the role that the American Cancer Society plays in, in why there isn't more research committed to children. 
Well, and as Dr. Hull said, um, sheer numbers for one thing, um, and and that, that is... That there are fewer children with right, cancer. Right, there are fewer children with cancer than adults, of course. Um, but that is something that the American Cancer Society has been really fighting for, not just for pediatric cancers, but for all cancers, just because um, due to inflation and um, the lack of new funding, the funding for cancer research has really decreased over the last about eight years. And um, right now, actually, it's something we're really fighting towards to um, getting more funding for research. The American Cancer Society is trying to um, fill that gap or um, certainly start some of those. Right now, we have 49 grants um, that are looking specifically at pediatric cancer. Um, but we, we fund young, um, new startup kind of uh, research. So uh, for it to, to come into or become a treatment, um, it really does need to go through the National Cancer Institute, and and that's of course where um, not every, of course, not every scientist, every researcher, um, gets that opportunity. But we are at least um, carefully searching through those studies and um, hoping to find those promising. Um, researchers to fund. Mm, I want to talk about that in a minute, but if you are just joining us, I'm Patty Satalia and this is Conversations Live Pediatric Cancer on WPSU-TV, WPSU-FM and WQLN-TV in Erie. Our guests tonight are Dr. Ray Hull, Director of the Penn State Hershey Cancer Institute. Jane Ulmer is the Senior Manager of the American Cancer Society's Mission Delivery for Pennsylvania and joining us on Skype is Dr. John Neely, Pediatric Oncologist at Penn State Hershey Children's Hospital. Our telephone number is 1-800-543-8242, and our panelists are ready to take your phone calls. If you'd prefer to email us, our address is connect at wpsu.org. You can also join us on Twitter. Find us under the address at WPSU and use the hashtag WPSU Conversations. Uh, according to uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, the impact of uh, the... the the success of chemotherapy in children has probably reached its limits, and 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 so there's it seems to be growing interest in uh, gene therapies and things like that. Can you talk uh, address that a little bit, Dr. Hall? Well, certainly. I mean, I I do think that for children's cancers and and for many adult cancers, uh, we have probably achieved uh, about as much benefit as we're going to get from most of the chemotherapy drugs that are out there. Meaning that we've been able to sort through how we need to put these drugs together, uh, what combination we can use, how much agents we, uh, the agent we can give, and we're getting incrementally in smaller and smaller improvements in, in survival uh, and benefit to, to patients. Uh, having said that, there's been a lot of attention paid uh, to uh, gene therapy is one example, uh, but you know, immune modulation of sorts, uh, immune therapy, uh, which really started in work that was done at the NCI, uh, you know, 30 plus years ago. Harnessing our own immune systems to fight immune cancer. System. Uh, and and there's two ways to harness the immune system. One is using antibodies that are made uh, that are directed against something unique in the tumor cells, uh, and the other is to make use of the cells in our body that are typically used for other purposes or, or have other purposes and that's you know to help fight infection and to and to uh, alter inflammation processes uh, and to really harness the energy of those cells if you will uh, and direct them towards cancer and and so I think those are today probably two of the, the biggest areas gene therapy is also very very active uh, you know, gene therapy is most is often combined with one of these other modalities as well. You know, we used to look at cancer as a single disease. Today, we recognize yeah. it as as literally hundreds of diseases, yeah. and it, it's really unique in each of us. And and so, I'm kind of curious to know how important it is that everyone's uh, treatment be personalized. You know, you may have, and, and I want to talk with you, Jan, about your own personal experience with cancer, mm -hmm. but you may look at two people with the same, you know, uh, uh, ALL, for example. Sure. You know, well, and, and obviously this whole 
uh, personalized medicine, or as uh, President Obama used in his State of the Union address, precision medicine, uh, or or is something that is very, very much in vogue. Uh, and I, what we're finding and talking a lot more about, and this is across the board, is that there are in some cases more similarities between, let's say, a breast cancer and one type of breast cancer and one type of lung cancer than two types of breast cancer. Interesting. In terms of the, the genetic mutations that have been developed that predispose somebody to those uh, particular cancers. And so you, while we think about cancers as being by organ based, so the, as um, Dr. Neely said, you know, something dealing with the lymphatic system or the, or the blood system, uh, if you will. Uh, there are many, many uh, similarities between some of those cancers and other cancers that we wouldn't even think would be associated based upon their genetic profile. Uh, and increasingly, people are talking about developing, uh, even when we talk about these cancers, talking about them, about what type of cancer they are, breast, prostate, lung, but more importantly, what sort of genetic mutations they have. Uh, so these are RAS-related cancers, or EGFR, just to use some terminology uh, that your viewers may not be very familiar with, but each of these uh, define certain molecular abnormalities that are unique to one or another type of cancer. Speaking of, of cancer, Jan, you actually, after 20 years of working in a cancer hospital, uh, contracted cancer yourself in 2008, multiple myeloma. Tell yes. us a, a bit about your experience and how it has influenced your work with the American Cancer Society and the patients you see on a daily basis. I was thinking about this today, uh, knowing, of course, that um, that might be a question posed to me. And um, frankly, it has been um, probably one of the um, best experiences of my life. Um, not just from my work, um, but certainly um, I, this week I had a lady who came in, uh, she had, was losing her hair, and um, I was able to pull my wig off and say, okay, here's, you know, here's what's going to happen when you want to put this on. And I think for her it was immediately um, a, a sense of comfort in, okay, you got me, you know, you know what I'm going through. Um, certainly you know deepened family relationships and um, discovered things about myself that I had never known I had had back pain for over a year um, I had gone to my doctors and um, every time we just thought oh it must be you know pulled muscle do exercise it would get better um, so I didn't get too concerned um, and then finally uh, had some x-rays and um, discovered a um, tumor on my spine and many areas of, of lesions throughout my bones. The interesting thing about what you're saying is that here's someone who works in the cancer uh, industry field and yet you didn't recognize the signs right off. Right. And I'm wondering how common that is, Dr. Hull. Enormously common and, and that's because you know, we, many, lots of people have headaches and we all have headaches at one time or another. Just because we have a headache doesn't mean we have a brain tumor. Patients with brain tumors will frequently have headaches though. So it, you know, the challenge is distinguishing between the aches and pains that we all normally experience just as part of being alive and, uh, you know, pulling the trigger and saying, boy, this doesn't quite seem right. And, and having it evaluated and having it turn out to be a, a cancer. Dr. Neely, I know that uh, pediatric cancers are often more aggressive than adult cancers, and so early detection is absolutely critical. What do you advise, uh, when do you advise parents to take a child to the doctor to see if cancer is, uh, is the problem? Well, it's a somewhat similar issue to what Dr. Hull was just talking about. Um, you know, we talked about the incidence of pediatric cancer. It's very rare. A pediatrician or a family doctor is quite possibly not going to see one in the course of their career. Uh, and how many kids come in with uh, fevers and feeling tired and have a virus uh, versus when it turns out to be leukemia? So I think um, quite often the warning signs as we talk about them are subtle to begin with 
And then it gets to be a, you know, a parent just becoming more concerned. And something that we quite commonly see is it sneaks up on the parents and Aunt Mabel comes in after not seeing the kids for six months and goes, oh my, your child is very pale. And that's the trigger it's because it can sneak up on the parents and then they feel guilty or they're angry with the doctor. And when in reality, it is very hard to make a diagnosis sometimes until some of the telltale signs get strong enough that it, it triggers somebody's concern. And what sorts of tests or procedures uh, would be necessary to positively diagnose cancer? I'll, I'll ask that of both you, Dr. Neely and Dr. Hull. Well, from a pediatric standpoint, it, it might depend on on the type of cancer, but in general, a, his, a really good history from the parents who are, you know, parents are the best source of knowing what's going on with their child. And then a physical exam uh, can give you a lot of clues. So for instance, if you saw a child that was tired uh, and achy and you noticed that they were pale, that would immediately trigger getting a blood count and that likely would give you a clue that there's something more serious going on. If you feel the belly, uh, I mean, we have had some very astute pediatricians in our area that on a well child exam pick up a mass in the belly and refer that kid in before the child had any kind of, of symptoms. So being being alert on the on the part of the physician and on the part of the parents. Dr. Hull, would, would you so, add to that? And, and for adults, it's, it's very similar uh, in the context that uh, it, it does sneak up on people, but I think in terms of the diagnosis, we know a significant, uh, a fair amount about risk factors. So, for example, you know, someone who is a tobacco user and or smokes, uh, they're going to be much more predisposed to lung cancer, f certainly. And so, that individual having a, a cough that's persistent and and goes on longer and a red flag. doesn't appear to be related to anything is a red flag. Uh, for, for GI cancers, lower GI tract cancers, colon and rectal cancer, you know, it's changing your bowel habits, seeing blood in the stool, uh, you know, those are obvious triggers. But as Dr. Neely said, you know, oftentimes it's, it's something doesn't feel right. You know, what, what's this lump uh, on the side of my neck here? Or, mm -hmm. you know, where, where, how come, you know, for certain types of sarcomas, which are common cancers uh, or tend to be more common in children, but we do see it in adults, and, and that would be, you know, a cancer involving the muscles or part of the skeletal system. Uh, and so very often it's pain or, you know, they actually feel something that's there. So, so there are clearly warning signs, uh, but then it's also knowing what risk factors are. You know, and, and our, for adults, all of the screening that the American Cancer Society uh, and others have brought forth are really based upon risk. You know, colon cancer, it's colonoscopies at age 50, and if you had first degree relatives who had colon cancer starting at 40, if not earlier. Uh, and so, so we know a fair amount about it, uh, and, and I think we do a good job when those screening uh, programs are, are adhered to. But of course there's no screening for the cancer that, that, uh, that you suffered from, uh, Jan. Uh, talk a little bit, if you would, about stages of cancer, because we often hear about, you know, stages zero through four, and, and then often uh, T, N, or M for tumors or lymph nodes sure. or met met metastasizing. What, what exactly does that mean? So, you know, the, the, the staging system for most cancers, uh, it really goes from one to four, uh, and there are some exceptions, and it's a combination of how big the initial tumor is, uh, and that's the so-called T system. Uh, whether the end part is has the tumor or the cancer cells spread outside of the initial mass uh, and gone to the lymph nodes, that would be the end part of it. And then M is had has the tumor gone to other organs, uh, such as the liver, the lungs, uh, places where the the cancers would typically metastasize to, and. You know, for some cancers, there's a very orderly progression uh, from one stage to the next to the next. Uh, for others, you know, it's either very localized or it's very extensive. Uh, and you know, I many times I have patients in my practice that worry about, well, gee, it's a you know, it's for certain types of cancers, lymph node cancers in particular. Uh, for many of them, it's either in one area in the lymph node or it's in many places and it doesn't, you know, we shouldn't worry too much about it because the treatment 
is, is in all likelihood going to be very similar for everything outside of just one area. Tell us a little bit about your treatment, Jan, because you have actually experienced this, and we know so often that chemotherapy, part of the big question seems to be what combination for your cancer, and then how long is long enough? Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate um, in my course of treatment that um, prior to uh, my being diagnosed a few years, Dr. Barlogi at the University of Arkansas um, actually utilized two of our um, grants to look at treatments or drugs that were already in existence and um, he, he tried those on multiple myeloma so that by the time that I was diagnosed um, it was a, a, a routine or an accepted therapy um, so I was on uh, Velcade and um, a drug that sounds very strange, but I was on um, thalidomide, which is a um, derivative, and you can talk much more about this, of um, thalidomide that was used oh with disastrous results. For um, pregnant right? mothers. Yes, yeah. yes. But it's been found to be effective in uh, multiple myeloma. It actually has been uh, refined, and uh, a new drug, Revlimid, has been developed uh, that I take now. But, um, and then I got what are called tandem stem cell transplants. I got two about three months apart um, and then um, continued on Revlimid for um, several more months after that. Uh, and then I was under no treatment um, until just the beginning of this year when I did have uh, a recurrence. But again, um, I'm back on a treatment that um, is, doesn't have that many side effects and um, has worked very well. Actually, I got blood work today um, that showed that my um, marker is back in normal range. So Good news, that's very great good news. news. Yes. I, I'm going to uh, give our telephone number in just a moment, but <clears throat> I think people don't quite understand remission. So we often talk about cancer in five-year survival intervals. Why the five years and what exactly, Dr. Hull, does remission mean? So remission uh, for usually means that there's no evidence of disease when you look for it. Now in the case of multiple myeloma, it's a much, much more complicated story because we have near complete remissions, you know, uh, complete remissions, uh, but it just means there's no evidence of the disease present when, we, when we're really talking about a complete remission. For most cancers, uh, we, we think, and this goes back to historic data, that if you're without any evidence of disease for at least five years, uh, that that remission means you're likely have been cured of that cancer and it, it won't come back. There are some exceptions, kidney cancer being one of them, skin cancer, melanoma being another one where individuals can, it can recur, you know, 10 or more years after the initial uh, development of the, the cancer. Uh, but it really gives, it gives an indicator as to how likely you are to be cured, hopefully, of your cancer. Uh, and the longer you're in remission, uh, the, generally speaking, the more likely you are of being cured. Uh, cancers, when they come back, tend to do so early, uh, usually within the first two or three years uh, of their initial diagnosis and treatment. All right. If you're just joining us, I'm Patty Satalia, and this is Conversations Live, Pediatric Cancer on WPSU-TV, WPSU-FM, and WQLN-TV in Erie. Our guests tonight are Dr. Ray Hull, Director of the Penn State Hershey Cancer Institute, Jane Ulmer, Senior Manager of the American Cancer Society's Mission Delivery for Pennsylvania, and joining us on Skype is Dr. John Neely, Pediatric Oncologist at Penn State Hershey Children's Hospital. Our telephone number is one 800 5 Four three eight two four two, and our panelists are ready to take your phone calls. If you'd prefer to email us, our address is connect at wpsu.org. You can also join us on Twitter. Find us under the address at wpsu and use the hashtag WPSU Conversations. Dr. Neely, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, secondary cancers among pediatric cancers. This is so common, and I'm wondering what influences whether children who have undergone cancer treatments uh, will have cancers later in life? Well, this is an area of major concern uh, to us because we now have, well, roughly 75% of our children with uh, cancer surviving. 
and we don't really know what the long-term effects of the therapy that they've been through is is going to be. We had a pretty early indication with leukemia when uh, we started to we made a major breakthrough in preventing relapses, which is the opposite of a remission. It's when you go out of remission uh, by using radiation to the brain and to the spinal cord, and uh, we used a fairly high dose of radiation. Uh, and it did prevent leukemia from from growing in the brain because the brain the brain's a funny protected area. Chemotherapy doesn't get into it uh, very readily, but it was enough radiation that down the line for those children that were surviving the cancer, um, they started to develop brain tumors. So we became aware of that, and what we've done over the course of time to individualize the care is that we immediately cut out the radiation to the spine. Uh, and we immediately about halved the uh, amount of radiation that we use in the brain, and we combine it with some chemotherapy we can put in the spinal fluid, and the incidence of, of brain tumors has gone away. And in some cases of leukemia now, we don't even use radiation at all, in fact, most. So uh, we customize our treatment to try to reduce risks, but nonetheless, any therapy, whether any of the chemotherapy, which is what we've used for the last 50 years, has its own set of stressors on uh, the body. They are very likely carcinogens in a way because they can cause mutations and we don't understand when or how. Uh, but we're worried that down the line, we're going to see other chronic diseases come up. Uh, and of course, you have to sort that out from the fact that adults over time, adults, many adults get cancer anyhow. So how do you know if it was from childhood cancer therapy or what, short of doing some genetic studies. Well, one thing you do know for sure, though, is that the majority of pediatric cancer survivors do have late effects from their chemotherapy or from their treatment. Can you describe what late effects we're talking about? They're, they're physical as well as emotional. Right. Well, yes. Uh, there are many there are many different kinds of late effects. I think the ones that, that have really hit our radar are the ones that uh, we became aware of and then started to adjust medications. A good example was a really excellent set of medications that came along probably in the 70s or thereabouts called adriamycin, donamycin. They're these red, red colored medicines and they look kind of like uh, some of the kids called it orange Kool-Aid when it was in the bags. Uh, but if you gave it in a high enough dose, it, 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 in a way, the effects of it never leave the body. And so it accumulates. And we began to realize that if you get over a certain amount, your heart goes into failure. And I've had one or two patients that have ended up having heart transplants. Wow. Because they had such bad heart failure way back when we didn't know. Nowadays, we limit the amount of those drugs. And so we don't get to that point. Uh, and we watch the heart very carefully. We, we do echoes all the time and all that. So we, we try our best to, to relieve, you know, relieve those effects. But nonetheless, with just regular therapy, we, we see issues with metabolism. Uh, children tend to be much heavier after chemotherapy, and we don't know whether that's because they became sedentary or whether they, it's changed their metabolism in some way. Uh, there are a, a fair number of learning disabilities that can happen in children. And, um, you know, and I think it's those kind of things that we, we uh, are beginning to see as late effects. And, of course, fertility is another issue. You know, if you, an undeveloped uh, young person how serious uh, is that problem, and is there a way to overcome fertility problems later in life? Right. Well, we do. Uh, well, you know, I think we have a rule in general that if somebody has not gone through puberty, their uh, uh, eggs and sperm are relatively protected, not entirely, uh, but I certainly have my share of young kids uh, who went through chemotherapy for leukemia or other tumors and, and now come back to visit me every once in a while uh, married and having a couple of kids. So, so fertility is not always an issue. But when you get into the teenage years, uh, we are more and more talking, having the frank talk, particularly with the boys, because boys, uh, young adults, tend to be more susceptible to chemotherapy than, than girls, mostly. So we have to talk about, about uh, donating and, and preserving and 
which you know is not something a 13 year old necessarily wants to hear about right but you have you we are trained to have that kind of a discussion and then what's coming along now uh for the young ladies is uh, whether we uh uh, do egg preservation, which is a little more involved, uh, but it's a doable thing. So we're very aware that we want to, you know, we want to bring up those topics and have them think about it in a forward-thinking <laughs> fashion. And most of them are rise, you know, just really do very well in having those kind of discussions. I give I give the young adults a lot of credit for uh, being mature about th talking about things like that. When a child has uh, cancer, this is something that obviously affects an entire family. What, Jan, does the American Cancer Society do to support families who are facing often, you know, weekly trips to the doctors, to the hospital, and perhaps for years? We will, um, we have our Road to Recovery program, and um, we will transport children, adults, uh, there's no income limit or, or uh, qualifications. Uh, we have trained volunteers who have gone through uh, background checks and uh, motor vehicle checks, so we know that they are safe drivers. And um, we have that across the United States. Pennsylvania has really led the way with road to recovery. Um, last year, we served about 1,800 patients with over 27,000 rides to treatment. Um, our volunteers are very, um, get very connected to these patients, obviously. Um, the parent has only to provide, if, there's, if they're young enough that they need a, um, a car seat, seat, then they need to provide that and, and actually put it in the car, but um, otherwise there is no charge to the patient. We also offer in um, Hershey and in Philadelphia, we have Hope Lodges. Um, we can't actually um, house the children there um, because of, of um, uh, immuno, immunologic concerns, but we certainly can um, host their, their families there while the, the child may be in the hospital. Um, we also now work with Extended Stay America, who last year provided us with 10,000 free rooms. Um, that's an agreement that we've reached. In, if, if someone calls the American Cancer Society or goes on cancer.org, um, they will find that there are about 7,000 resources just in Pennsylvania. Some of them may be um, national resources. But if someone is having difficulty getting their insurance to pay for a treatment, we actually have a department at our National Cancer Information Center who will walk them through and help them with um, nego negotiating and navigating. Um, maybe it's a coding issue, and so they can help them with that. Um, we have, you know, many support systems that parents can avail themselves of. You mentioned uh, insurance, and I was dumbfounded to read that a year of chemotherapy in 2010 was $10,000. In 2012, it was over $100,000. Uh, how? And of course, uh, we talked about chemotherapy perhaps reaching the end of its impact. Um, you were involved in developing novel new drugs. Just what a, how challenging is this? Where's the money coming from? And are they going to be equally as expensive? Um, equally expensive, if not more, more. expensive, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. And that's the trend. And, and, and that's the challenge that, quite frankly, is facing our healthcare system today. Um, how do we pay for and afford these very, very expensive Why and are they so expensive? expensive agents? Multiple reasons for it. Um, the cost of, of developing these agents in many cases is, is becoming increasingly more expensive uh, or higher. The, um, the regulatory aspects in terms of what needs to be done in order for these agents to be approved by the regulators in this country, our uh, Food and Drug Administration, uh, but that's similar uh, around the, the world, actually. Um, and so, and it, it really has to do with the companies and the research efforts that are being put into developing agents. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of it has to do with the patent laws out there right now uh, in terms of, you know, how long a company that's that's put time and effort into and money into developing a drug how long they have to feel that they can recoup their investment and, and that's a whole nother topic obviously 
Well, the FDA in 20 years has only approved two new chemotherapy drugs for children. Wow, that's almost nothing. Mm -hmm. can, can you speak to that, Dr. Neely? Two new uh, drugs specifically geared for children in 20 years. I, well, I think there's two aspects to it. One is that we do share a fair number of, of agents between the adult world and the pediatric world. So, so each group takes advantage of the other. But then when you think about some of the uniqueness of uh, childhood, the rare childhood cancers, that, that when a drug gets developed, it's the, the place to use it is going to be a very small number of people. And so the, the incentive to try to, to design a drug and look for a drug for such a small number of people uh, in, in the current system just becomes impossible. And we have, you know, it's, they're, they're often that's called orphan drugs because they are uh, drugs that just don't find a use for a lot of other things. Hmm. Clinical trials, I know, are hugely important among children. Uh, I want to talk about that among adults, uh, adults too. Uh, I was watching The Emperor of uh, All Maladies, which I recommend, highly recommend, the Ken Burns series that uh, people listening and, and uh, watching tonight watch when it becomes available at the end of March. Uh, they, they featured a, a young man by the name of a boy named Jimmy, and uh, this is when in the early days of uh, raising funds for cancer research. And so Americans were digging into their pockets to help save Jimmy. And the interesting thing about it was they didn't tell Jimmy that he had cancer. What today, Dr. Neely, does the child undergoing cancer know about their condition? What's the philosophy behind that? Yeah, it's really different. Um, we are we're very upfront. Uh, now, obviously, what you talk about to a four-year-old is different than a 14-year-old. Uh, but nonetheless, we have a rule that we don't lie. And uh, we present information on what's going on at their age level, what our plan is, and what they can expect. Uh, quite often, it's painful for parents. They, they, uh, the last thing you want to do is tell your child that they have something serious like that. But we're upfront with parents too that in the long run you know uh, if you just think about these kids that come into our clinic and they're sitting amongst all the other kids that have bald heads you know kids put two and two together so you need to be you need to be upfront and uh, cancer is not the scary thing I mean it's serious but it's not the scary thing that it was 50 60 years ago where you know when I first learned about this it was never called leukemia it was called anemia you have anemia you know the word leukemia like everybody knew was that was just like the end of the road. So people hid it. In some cultures, that's still the case. But uh, the evolution in, in childhood cancer is that we're very upfront and, and truthful in an age-appropriate way. How important are clinical trials among the pediatric population, Dr. Neely? We would not survive uh, without them. And the reason is that if you take any given institution, for instance, Hershey, uh, we see roughly 100 new patients a year of children with cancer, of which maybe 30 are, are leukemia patients. If you tried to do a study and you're following patients out for five years, you just don't get anywhere with 30 patients nowadays because the, the, the ability to advance uh, uh, treatment has become more difficult. So, you know, back in probably the 60s, these different groups like like uh, major children's hospitals around the country called the people that knew each other called each other and said you know we need to have a cooperative group and at the time there were basically two cooperative groups that developed kind of east coast west coast and um but we would not have gotten done studies that involved uh, 2,000 children over the course of a year or so had we not banded together because childhood cancer is that rare Clinical trials among the adult population, Dr. Hull, how important? Uh, absolutely important, and we don't do nearly such a good job. And a good job is because the, the advances in childhood cancers, as Dr. Neely indicated, where 75% of children are alive uh, and have, have been cured of their cancer, it's a very, we're very, very far from that in, a, in the adult world. And largely because you know, we're, Clinical trials allow us to take what we think is the best therapy out there and compare it to something that might be better. Uh, that would be a classic large clinical trial. But clinical trials also for new agents coming out 
let us see how active they are in certain diseases, and, and really allow the, the treatments to advance uh, so that 20 years from now, patients, our patients would benefit from what we've learned about it. And I, at, outside of a clinical trial, it is almost impossible to really sort out which therapy is, is good for what type of cancer. Parents seem to be anxious for their child to be enrolled in a clinical trial. Adults seem to be more reluctant. Why is that the case? Well, I'll let Dr. Neely respond to the pediatric uh, part of it, but for, for adults, you know, adults look on the internet, they, they, they see what they have, they've heard negative things just from the experience of other um, adults. So many adults have cancer in contrast to children. Almost everybody knows somebody in their family or friends that have had cancer and have seen them go through treatments. Uh, and uh, frequently those treatments are chemotherapies, the outcomes aren't very good, and so patients are just oftentimes not interested and want the best treatment, whatever it is. In some cases we know a best treatment. Uh, in Quite frankly, in many, many, t much of the time, um, we, we may say we know the best treatment, but we really don't. I, I mean, and, I, and the challenge is that um, the practitioners, the oncologists, and the patients, uh, their decisions to, to do things outside of clinical trials. And then, but then the other side of the coin is that adults are very, very complicated. They have many other illnesses, heart disease, lung disease, diabetes. So that may prevent them from th being in a clinical trial. That may trial. prevent them from being in a clinical trial. So, so having a trial that somebody could actually enroll in is, is also challenging. Uh, along the way. And I think a lot of adults say, but I don't, I want to know I'm getting something that may help me. But the days you said of placebos for the, yeah. the control population are sort of gone. They're, they're largely gone. I mean, I think that, you know, any clinical trial is, is very, very well thought out. Uh, there are really, you know, experts around the country and around the world in many cases that have carefully thought through the treatments and you know, there, it's very unusual to have a trial that's, you know, would be entirely inappropriate for, for a patient and based on that and, and considered unethical. Those sorts of trials just don't happen today. Uh, Dr. Neely, why are our parents uh, of pediatric patients interested in, in clinical trials, perhaps more so than adults? Well, I think it is the nature of where the children end up. Uh, because pediatric cancers are so rare, uh, pediatric oncologists almost entirely are at academic health centers. And because of that, we are, are just our mental model is that we're here to learn and here to study, and uh, we just automatically present the uh, situation to uh, to the parents in in uh, what but maybe the public doesn't quite know the degree to which we as physicians on adult and pediatric side do what's called informed consent where we um, sit down with the family or the patient for a young adult or an adult and go through in great detail uh, what's going on what the choices are for therapy uh, the purpose of a study, and it typically is what we consider the gold standard, which is what we know is best versus that plus something new, uh, assuring them that if they decide not to be on uh, a study that we don't abandon them. We still take care of them in the best way that we know. And yes, there are some parents that say, you know, we just as soon go with the sure thing, with the gold standard. Uh, and we don't want to take the risk of more toxicity from another, the other arm or something. But most of the parents understand that their child is benefiting from a high cure rate because the child before them, five, ten years before them, uh, did, um, uh, you know, a clinical trial. So I think it's the, the nature of how it's set up when, when parents come in with their children at an academic health center. You've spent 40 years as uh, an oncologist, hematologist, and the last 10 years, the last decade, you've uh, been very interested in what I'll call functional medicine or integrative medicine. What, Dr. Neely, does that uh, lend to pediatric cancer, this holistic approach to medicine? 
Well, you know, of course, I'm biased because I think that a holistic approach, and most physicians would say this too, that when you're treating somebody with a devastating disease, you do need to look at the whole person. And people that do a good job with their nutrition, which is very hard in cancer patients, or do a good job with reducing risk factors for getting cancer in the first place, you know, when you talk about adult cancers or cardiovascular disease, all the things that are killers in the adult world, they all start as in, in childhood. And so we, as pediatricians, need to do a better job in, in preventative care, thinking forward to adulthood. So, um, you know, when I see patients in my integrative medicine clinic that have cancer, they usually come in either wanting to get through the chemotherapy better, and so we talk about things that will help them, because I, I do not discourage them from doing the, the therapy that is considered the best therapy that we know but we help them get through it. Uh, they want to know how to reduce the risks of having things come back, and we you know, don't know as much about that as we would like, but it usually comes along with maintaining good health uh, through nutrition, uh, tending to one's immune system to make sure that they're, they're well, and those kind of things. And, and then the other thing that's interesting that's coming along with some of our studies is um, you know, there's always been this interest in natural agents, um, and like turmeric, for instance, you know, is just as an example. Well, the we spice. Now, yeah, the spice. We now know that the active agent in that has some pretty profound effects on the immune system, and and so there's a growing interest in whether some of these things that are quote natural agents have things in them that we can isolate out that can be used in. A, usually along with our current chemotherapy, to alter some of these pathways, these genetic pathways that get overexpressed in certain tumors. So I think there's a lot of things coming along that um, uh, ch ch children, I mean, the parents come in uh, with saying, how can we do a better job with cancer for our children? And then I have some adult patients come into my adult uh, integrative medicine clinic uh, having questions about their cancer therapy. You look, Dr. Hole, like you wanted to add something. Oh, well, I, and I've had uh, at, at least uh, a couple of my patients see Dr. Neely for exactly that. Uh, but from a practical perspective, I, I do agree that things that, you know, 20, 30 years ago we might have dismissed as being not terribly scientific, uh, really increasingly we were beginning to understand why this approach is working. So whether it has, it alters the it, things that are inflammatory agents in the body, so-called inflammatory cytokines. You know how your outlook. You know what what people talk about is this terminology, mind wellfulness, uh, which is how how good you feel. Well, it turns out that that really does impact on how you handle chemotherapy, what your how your cancer responds to chemotherapy, and. The challenge with that is that we really have not uh, historically understood how it all works, but increasingly we're discovering the things that that Dr. Neely described. Uh, that many of these approaches, there are there is a biological basis for it. It's just we didn't recognize it very well. So, uh, you know, I couldn't agree more. I, I want to follow up on that in just a moment, but we do have a tweet. This this is more of a comment. Uh, this person tweets, how on earth is this affordable? A year of chemo went from 10,000 in 2010 to 100,000 plus, I should say, in 2014. If you could comment on that. Uh, it's a great question, uh, for, for sure. Um, you know, one way to view it is that depending upon what the treatment is used for, uh, that it, it may save uh, other things. So it may reduce hospitalizations. It may enable that person to continue to work. Uh, and to be productive in society. So, so it's not just an absolute cost that we're looking at because what, you know, most of these treatments are really intended to, to have people uh, continue to move on with their lives and, and continue to work and do all the kinds of things that we do every day. So uh, it, it, having said that, it is very expensive, no question about it. Dr. Neely mentioned uh, his clinic and, and you said something uh, that, that leads me to this. At the Children's Hospital of Orange County in California, they have, when kids come in for chemotherapy, there's something called the infusion aquarium. The idea is to distract kids. They're in this environment uh, where 
you know, they're not there. It's not a medical environment uh, where they can kind of forget that they are cancer patients. Um, they're looking at, they're literally like in what would be an aquarium where there are video games and age appropriate things for them to do. Is True. that something that Hershey has? And do you believe in something like that? Well, I, I certainly believe in something like that. I mean, I think stress levels, you know, is clear, you know, would be lowered uh, in that sort of environment. And there are very good studies out there for many cancers, ovarian cancer being one of them, that the woman undergoing treatment for her ovarian cancer, the more stress she's under, uh, the poorer her outcome is going to be as compared if, if less so. And I fully expect that in the pediatric world, and I'll let Dr. Neely comment on that, that, that those same sorts of things would be there. Yeah, we have just a couple of seconds, Dr. Neely, if you have a, a comment for us. Well, our, you know, our, our children's hospital is full of uh, features like that. We have child life specialists that come in and work with distraction techniques for, for patients with helping them deal with understanding their disease at a given level. We have teen lounges, we have playrooms, okay. we have aquariums, all those kind of things to all help right. make it look like a you know, a more normal life. And I want to end with Jan Ulmer. What role, what would you like Pennsylvanians to know about the role that the American Cancer Society can play in helping uh, children and families uh, where pediatric cancer well, is an for issue? for anyone, um, we do not magically know of everyone that's been diagnosed with cancer. So you need to call, either go to cancer.org or the 1-800-227-2345 to avail yourself of our, of our services and then start telling them what your needs are and how we can help oh. and we're there for them. All right, thank you so much. Our guest tonight, Dr. Ray Hole, director of the Penn State Hershey Cancer Institute, Jane Ulmer, senior manager of the American Cancer Society's Mission Delivery for Pennsylvania, and Dr. John Neely, pediatric oncologist at Penn State Hershey Children's Hospital. Be sure to watch the new PBS documentary, Cancer, the Emperor of All Maladies, presented by Ken Burns, airing next Monday, March 30th through April 1st at 9 p.m. on WPSU. Thank you all for watching and listening. I'm Patty Satalia. For all of us here at WPSU, have a good night.